I really thank you for coming out of this because um, leadership determines the strength of the church and the, uh, good churches rise and fall on the quality of leaders and and um, at one stage we all at, at some stage we all lead at different levels whether we lead in families or or um, or um, in in the work environment or wherever we are God has placed us there to lead and the greatest opportunity we have to lead is to lead people to the Lord. So it's a very important uh, part of ministry. And so I, I'm, I'm going to be speaking on a little bit of our history. Today the mandate for tonight is to speak on our history and then our values, which Deborah will do. And then I'm going to speak a little about vision. And so this little book um, I gave you as a book I, I put together for our leadership uh, teams. We'll get Andy and Sarah, some of these, but, um, uh, you know, I encourage you to go through them to um, uh, a lot of what you'll hear uh, comes from Dudley and so on. Deborah, uh, our history is I got saved into a New Covenant Ministries church, into my church, and so I've been with this team or relating to this team for, uh, for 30 years or so now, so I don't know much else outside of what we learn here, so I can't be confused. But I do study other church models. Um, and, um, you know, everything, like I say, I, I've learned, I've learned from others. Obviously, have God has um, revealed things to me. But much of what I'm going to speak to you about tonight is um, standing on the shoulders of the giants that have gone before us. And so, just a little bit about our history. I don't know if you know anything about uh, this church and how it started. Um, I was uh, in leadership in a, t in a church in South Africa and uh, had a good job, loved the church, loved being an elder in the church. And I remember telling friends of mine who were full-time that I would never, ever go full-time. I loved the church and I loved my job, and that's how it was going to be. And, uh, but in 1992, um, I, I felt uh, in God that He was leading me to, to plant a church, and um, one day, and uh, started chatting to Deborah about that. Uh, she was a little bit shocked at first because I so loved what I did uh, in in business. And but uh, over a period of time, we started praying as to where that church would be. And uh, the wisdom of the day was to plant a church in your own nation if it's your first church plant. Uh, but I'm not very wise, and so <laughs> I felt in God to be overseas. And so we. Um, we started a journey. I traveled a bit with my business, so we started a journey, and wherever God would take us, um, we would pray about it and see if, if that's where God wanted us to plant a church. Um, so to, to say that, God confirmed in our hearts in 1994, we were in Canada and Toronto, and that it was Canada, and so we started the process of getting here. And we arrived in Nanaimo. In 1997, we lived just below the markets, and they had their binoculars out wondering what these weird people were doing when we were asking their children to come to church. They, didn't, weren't, they weren't sure if they wanted them to come to our church in the basement. But uh, uh, that's how we started. We started, we didn't know one Christian in the city. I had a sister that lived here who was unfortunately not saved, but moved to, to uh, Calgary. And it was just us and our children uh, in, our, in our home. And um, after a while, uh, through Christy and Julia Hancox, um, meeting our boys, we met them. And uh, they were our first uh, suspects. And uh, they've been with us ever since, or well, Bob has, and, and Julia and, and Christy. And it's uh, wonderful to still have them in the life of the church. Um, and to see what God has do done. And um, I'm just so pleased that when people join now, they think it's been here forever. And I love that. I love the fact about that. But uh, suffice to say, if God can use us, He can use anybody. And when He calls you, I encourage you to respond to the call. And we're gonna, I'm going to be speaking about dreams and visions a bit later on. But that's a little bit of our history in a nutshell. That was in 1997. And uh, here we are today. With, uh, it took us about two years to get a church this size, I think, maybe more. And uh, so thank you for being part of what we're doing. And, 
and partnering with us. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to call Deborah up here to um, come and share on our values. Values. What are our values? I think every one of us has a value of some sort. And here at Oceanside, we have a list of core values. A value is something which we treasure. It's something that we hold dear to. It's not a rule. It's not a regulation. It's just something that we treasure. And our first one is that we stand on the Word of God. Our number one, which is totally non-negotiable, is our foundation on a non-negotiable value is that the Bible in its entirety is the inspired and the authoritative word of God and is, is the only accept, acceptable standard of life, ministry, and conduct in the church. And you can read that in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, is that the word of God is inspired by the Lord. We don't go on our opinion, what we think is right or what we think is wrong. But what does the Holy Word of God say? That is the plumb line of everything that we do here at Oceanside. Secondly, the mobilization of the priesthood of all believers. We believe that through our friendships we function and we desire to empower and involve the priesthood of believers. So that's whether you, right from the youngest age, and that's why I'm so excited about 180, which is our kids' church, is that we are encouraging from the youngest to the oldest to prophesy and to speak the word of God. It doesn't matter that you have, like, you, you don't have to wait to a, a certain age to be able to minister. We believe in the gathering. It's a, the mobilization of the priesthood of all believers. In Second Peter, it talks about we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart. Mike, if you want to do any of these, just stop me, right? Because, you know, I get like a train. Dudley Daniels, one of the guys at the cornerstones of um, New Covenant, and you'll hear Michael mention Dudley's name a lot. He had the saying that friendship before, during, and after, func uh, after function, so that we don't do things because we have to do them. We do them because we want to be together. And I think that is how family works, right? Generosity is another value. We aim to resource all aspects of ministry as the, uh, defined in Acts 1.8 with our finance, gifting, and people. Everything that I have is a gift from God. And so I hold on to things loosely. I look after it. I'll be a good steward of what God ha has given me, but is to live a generous lifestyle. Not how can I rip somebody off, right? It's not giving the a little bit, but that we would be wholehearted in everything that we do. I think one of the scriptures that scares me the most is about King Josiah. King Josiah did everything that was right in the eyes of God. He tore down idols. He got people to start studying the word of God again. But you know, right at the very end, the thing about Josiah was that he was not wholehearted in what he did. And I thought, God, you know, we can do things that with all our heart and all our might, but we can do them without a generous spirit where we're not doing everything full on wholeheartedly. Amen? So generosity is a, is a core value that we have here at Oceanside. Family is very important in all that we do. Like one of our hearts is that the whole family, like I love you guys. You, get, you guys are a phenomenal example of that. Your whole family gets in boots and all. And um, that, that is a value. It's, it's not... Christianity, our, our worship to God is not just for mom and dad, or it's not just for mum to go off to church on a Sunday, or not, not that she goes off to church, she goes to worship because we are the church, right? But we strive to involve the whole family, so that is why we put emphasis on our, from the youngest to the oldest, that everybody has a vital part to play in worship at Oceanside. But can I also say in the same token, that our family do not become the idol. There's a balance, right? So although we strive for the whole family, we strive for a relationship that the whole family come together, we don't make family an idol. Um, and please don't shoot me down now, but uh, <laughs> even things like birthdays, if, if, there, if there was a conference and it fell on my birthday or whatever, um, and 
And what happened, you know what I mean? Like we just said, okay, fine. You know what? We're not all going to have mass exodus. Well, because it was my birthday, although I'm still a little bit bitter about my 40th, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but the thing is, though, is that like, we don't, no, we, we, we learn to give and take. And I think that is, you know, I, I think that is very, very healthy. Hospitality, my favorite, is living for the benefit of others. And I think those of us that have gone on to, when we visited different churches and we've just seen the open heartedness of how other families have embraced us when we've gone and ministered makes us want to open up our hearts and makes us want to open up our homes so that people can be equally blessed because we learn so much from each other when we do that hospitality and i just love that where it says that be hospitable because you don't know who you're going to be entertaining because they could be there are angels in our midst you know and i think most of us can go you know what there was something pretty <laughs> something heavenly about that little visitation you know and you might have had encounters of those. Hi. Heartfelt praise and worship. It's not just being able to sing like an angel. But we seek to worship God in all that we do, keeping Christ central and express, expressing our worship in diverse and creative ways. We believe that worship is a lifestyle and is not just a Sunday morning activity. And worship is not just singing hallelujah. Worship is whatever I do, I do unto you, O oh God. So our lifestyle, even if I'm putting gas in my car, is to do it with a good attitude. So we're really having to tweak our attitude all the time. If I'm standing in Costco and there's a lineup that's going way up there, don't jam the person in front of you with your trolley because you're in a hurry. Because why? It's a lifestyle of worship. Whatever I do, that I'd be pleasing instruments in your hands, O oh God. Prayer. We acknowledge the total need for God and His Spirit in every area of our lives. So therefore, prayer and spiritual warfare precedes all that we do. You know, so often we, like, we can just think that this is a good idea, but what does God have to say? And David, we can read in the Old Testament, he inquired of the Lord before he went to battle. When he did that, he was victorious. When he did what he thought was a good idea, they got totally annihilated. So whatever battle, whatever situation that you find yourself facing, it's a good idea to start it off in prayer. Lord, what is it that you have? Um, in Proverbs it says to us that when we come before the Lord, man plans but God directs. So does it mean that you throw your brain out? No, not at all. We still think, Lord, these are my steps and I present them before you. May you guide them. And may I not lose it when that door shuts. You know, I've heard people say, well, when the door shuts, try the window. When the window is shut, try the chimney. Anyway, just to bend it, you know, just to, bend it to make, make it fit. And, um, but God is faithful. He shows us the ways that we should go, right? And Isaiah, he says that we're not to be, like he will whisper to the left, to the right, which way we should go. Jeremiah 33, 3, Michael says this often, God's telephone number to us, call unto me and I will answer you and teach you and tell you wonderful things. Mikey, do you want to do some of these, babe? Gifts of the, of the Spirit. We eagerly desire in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 14, verse 1, the gifts of the Spirit to be manifest in and through our lives on an individual and corporate basis as we function as a body under the headship of Jesus Christ. And that's where we see Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. A people who are supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. Okay, that is a fabulous little nugget, that we would be a people who are supernaturally natural and naturally supernatural. So I don't Oh, I feel hallelujah. <laughs> but I can just say, Laura, you know what? I'm really just feeling in God that, you are, that he just loves you. You are just a beautiful daughter. And he just wants to honor you and bestow you and lavish his love on you. Just, just receive it. I don't have to go, oh, thus saith the Lord. No, 
Okay, I must just be naturally supernatural in everything that I do. And I get really freaked out when people start to, whoa, in front of me. I go, oh, dear Lord. <laughs> Winning souls and discipleship is another core value. Evangelizing and caring for our growing individuals in Christ as we reach into our community and nations with the gospel and the dynamic um, and dynamic of practical ministry, therefore fulfilling the Great Commission. So if that is on our hearts, even though we think, I am not an evangelist, Jesus said, go into all the world. Go into everywhere and preach the good news. And I think, you know, if we always use a lineup uh, of standing in the, in the grocery lineup or wherever it is, where we just think, oh, do I, am I going to play solitaire? Am I going to play Candy Crush or whatever on my phone? Or am I actually going to stand here and go, God, what is it? There are so many people around me. I'm surrounded by a sea of faces. What is it that I can say? I felt really challenged on Sunday when, was it Sunday when Josh said how, it was, was in a prayer group, he said, like, he goes now and just actually asks the Lord. I, and I remember people were doing treasure hunting, you know. So it's like actually using our time valuably wherever we go. So I felt very convicted. No more Candy Crush. <laughs> But we have a heart that wants to win souls and wants to go and just spread the love of Jesus, not in a freaky way, just in a supernaturally natural way. To train and equip all believers in leadership. Um, I've heard it said that, golly, Oceanside is just leadership, 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 leadership. Well, maybe we are, but we see the necessity of lifestyle that we Train and lead people. I mean, I, I, even with our little grandkids, the youngest, uh, we will take by the hand and we, we speak, and this is why you do this, this way and not that way, right? We are leading people. Don't just let people, oh, one of my best stories, I remember walking behind a group of guys and they had just hot. Oh, I am so repulsed by people spitting. Please, none of you spit in public. <laughs> I don't care what kind of a cold you have. Anyway, these young guys had just done that. And I said, I turned around and I said, and what do you think you're going to do with that? <laughs> and I said, don't you dare spit that out on the pavement. Well, these guys went bright red. Like, you know, their bum was sticking out. Like, you know, the chains, the whole thing. And the... <laughs> so you see, we can be leading even just in a natural way, okay? This teaching good manners. Men, I want to see chivalry. And ladies, allow the men to be chivalrous toward us. That's leading. That's, so it's not only just in spiritual matters, but just in daily, daily walks of life, because it's by our fruit that people will recognize that there is something different. Amen? So we train all and equip all believers in leadership. We are committed to raising up and releasing good, godly servant leaders who lead by a lifestyle example. Leaders who are always part of the solution and never part of the problem. What is my lifestyle? Is my walk lining up with my talk? And then to have an apostolic prophetic heart. Mike Hanchard uses this phrase, is see the future, prepare for the future, and become the future. See the future, prepare for the future, and become the future. To be a people who greatly embrace the commission, or the great commission of going into all the world. And then small groups, which help facilitate our vision. And one of our hearts, that's why we were so stoked when Doug joined the team, was that with the small groups, you know. And I know we emphasize small groups, small groups, but when small groups, it keeps us accountable. Like we, and just, we hear each other's hearts because on a huge big gathering, when, when the people come together on a Sunday morning, we don't actually have that one-on-one -on -one heartbeat, that conversations, but in the small groups, those are very, very vital, and we see that as a, as a, a core value for us here at Oceanside, because that is a safe environment um, just to be you and allow others to get to know you in a more personable way. 
Amen? Amen. Thank you. Maybe write them down because really what our values are are our treasures. You know, we can say we have a value, but unless we treasure it, it's actually not a value. So these things written down here, they the value of the church, but they need to be walked out. That's who we are. That's what we believe God's called us to be. And many of those um, we, uh, we felt before we even arrived here. And so um, now that was great. Um, I want to speak on vision uh, for a while and, um, and just unpack a few things there. Um, but before that, I do that. I tell you, one of the key scriptures for a leader, one of the scriptures I value the most, especially dealing with, with people and with sheep. You know, you know sheep bite, eh? And goats bite. So, so um, this, is, this is a key scripture for me for ministry. And it's Colossians 3, uh, 23 to 25. And I think if we get this in our hearts, we're never disappointed. Because uh, it says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Deborah spoke a little bit about that, but God speaks a lot about the heart. And um, um, was it Hezekiah you spoke about? Deb? Hezekiah? Was it Hezekiah that you spoke about? Who? Josiah. Yeah, it says about him and I think Hezekiah too that they, they, they did what was required by the Lord, but they didn't do it with all their heart. And so we can go through the motions, but it's our heart that God wants to capture. So do it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. It's a key that you as leaders need to, because so often you don't, uh, we shouldn't feed off the praise of men, but uh, it often doesn't happen. People don't see what you do and so on. So our security is not in, the praise of man, although we should be encouraging each other, our security and the reason we do it is for the Lord. And it says, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. And this is here. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And I think if you get that in your heart, in whatever you're doing, and uh, before you go out and do things, just remind yourself of that on a daily basis. Listen, this is not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the ultimate price for us, and uh, we serve Him in gratitude for saving us. Um, Roy passed away this afternoon, and um, I spent a lot of time with him and um, uh, over this time. And um, you know, it's just so, such a peaceful time when you know that it's a brother. He's a brother going to be with the Lord. And um, although we grieve. I bet you he's having one heck of a party up there right now. And so, so that would be a huge value for me, is a revi- reminding myself of who it's all about. And then uh, with regards to a church, what would, what would I do? I, what do we as Oceanside, what do I believe that we want to be? And it's a high bar, and um, it's the Church of Thessalonica, actually. And um, we want to be a model church. This is what I believe God has called us to be, a model church and a church of influence and impact. You see, a church of a thousand that is not reaching out, not fulfilling the Great Commission, has no influence or impact. And you can have a church of 50 that is gung-ho and changing the city and the nation, and yet we judge it by size of people and not by impact. And God doesn't do that. And he doesn't do that for this church. And so um, whatever we want to, whatever we do here, we want to duplicate. And even in the traveling that we do, it's to help the churches, the smaller churches, like we were helped when we started by apostolic ministry. And so this church has a huge impact. This church is known throughout the world uh, within what we do. Um, and I don't say that with pride. I say that with humility. But it's a fact that Oceanside is having a huge impact. And we want to continue to do this. And this is what it says in First Thessalonians 4, verse 2. I know you've read the book, and please keep reading it. I, I was so pleased to start reading it again. I haven't read it for a few years. It's just like life to me. Um, I grew up um, uh, under Dudley's ministry like that. And this is what Paul says of this church. We always thank 
God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continue to remember you uh, before God our Father. What, what does he remember then? For, for your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know, brothers, are loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. I want to see more of that in our church, for sure, and in our lives. You know that we lived amongst you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy uh, given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model church to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. And that's what I believe that God is wanting to raise up. And I, I, I don't know whether we'll ever get there, but that's one of the values and the heart of this church. One. Yeah, first chapter there from verse 3 for a while. And so I want to speak on vision. And, um, and so I want to answer three questions in doing this. This is very important. You'll see by the first scripture we read. But I want to answer the question of what is vision? Uh, what is the vision of Oceanside Church? And then what kills vision in the life of the church? And I want to ask you on that to give it some thought on some of the things that will kill the vision of the church. Um, and so, God permitting, we'll be able to get through this plenty of time. We will have lots of time in the end to, to chat. But in Habakkuk 2, verse 2 to 3, it says this, write down the revelation, and in the King James it says, write down the vision and make it plain on tablets so a herald may run with it. And excuse me for that. Sorry. So that make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation, the vision waits for an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for us, for it, it will certainly come and will not delay. And we're going to, to speak a little bit about the appointed time and waiting for the vision to be, be, be fulfilled. So I want to first speak about what is vision and some of it is in that little book uh, uh, I've got there but um, I don't think you'll be able to follow it in there but you can read about it and so I want to say this first of all we must not confuse our goals or our values with our vision they're totally separate our goals are stepping stones to our vision but we cannot confuse the two you see, our ultimate vision is Jesus, our example, and God. And we need to be changed to become like Him. That is the goal, being transformed into His likeness. But this is what it says about vision. And this, um, a lot of this I got from a friend of mine, Ian McKellar. He's written a few books, and, um, and uh, he was speaking on this, and I've just added some stuff to it. But it says, vision comes in dreamlike form. And Proverbs 29, 18 says, without vision you perish. And when you feel like perishing, it's your vision that will stop you. So we should have personal vision for our life and personal vision for the church. And we're going to speak a little bit about that. Uh, 29, 18. What I can do for you like is I can um, email this to to Dina, and you can have these notes, and, um, and so on. When you feel like perishing, it's your vision that will stop you. In Genesis 37, speaking of Joseph, it says, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him, and, and then we will see what comes of his dreams. And this, is a, this passage was, a pa I've actually stood there where this plaque is at, uh, at the Lincoln Memorial as you look after the the pool of remembrance or whatever it is across. And that's where he had, and he spoke that, that amazing um, speech of his, I have a dream. And so it was put on a plaque, this one, here comes a dreamer, come, let us kill him, and we'll see what comes 
of his dreams. He said, I have a dream. You see, the powerful thing about a dream and about a vision is that if it's caught by the people, you can kill the dreamer, but you can never kill the dream once it's been caught by others. And that's why vision is so important. Once it's been caught by a church or community, it becomes yours. You own it, own it, and you become inspired by it. This is the power of a church, a church motivated by vision and not by control or manipulation. You know, we're called to lead the sheep into green pastures sometimes, through the valley of the shadow of death, through deserts, and so on. But if the church catches the vision, it doesn't matter about the leadership. Eventually, it will continue, the current leadership. You see, if one kills a controller, it simply causes chaos in the land. And in the, in the church too, you see the churches are run by... Uh, now, there's leadership, and we'll speak about that in this, but, but um, normally when a dictator or a controller is killed, chaos follows. It's like taking a cork out of a bottle. All this, this pent-up anger and emotion... Um, but if one kills a dreamer, the, the people continue the dream. And it's for us to dream big. Because if we have small dreams, they're not God dreams. And even trying to be and say that's the church that we want to be like, a model church like that, that has influence and impact around the world. I remember sharing the vision of this church when we first started. And we would have a few couples come off the street. If they were walking their dogs, we would tackle them and drag them in and uh, eat their dog, and I thought that's what hot dogs were in the beginning, and, uh, and uh, I remember sharing the, the vision of this church, and we had about six people in, and Deborah and I there, I think maybe the Hancocks were, were there, Bob was sleeping on the couch more than likely, but um, I, sh- I was sharing the vision, and I remember the, one of the ladies says, oh no, that's way too big for me. She says, all I want to do is come in a community that we just get together and hang in all of that. That vision's way too big for me. And I, I took that actually as a compliment. You see, the kingdom of God involves being a prophetic community inspired by dreams and visions. If you read Acts 2, when the, when the Spirit of God comes, Peter has this, this I got it message. He says, man, this is what it's all about. This is what the prophet Joel said. In the last days, young men will dream dreams or old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions and I'll pour out my spirit on all people and they will prophesy. And you see, Acts 2 tells us that the prophetic people of God will be a people of dreams and visions. And it's up to the leaders to lead people closer to their dreams. So we used to say this, and that's changed. Your vision has to be laid down for the greater vision of the local church. And I, over the years, have come to see it totally different. God gives each of you a vision, and it should complement the vision of the local church. What God has gifted you to, how can I use my dream and my vision to fill the greater vision? And we'll see what that is for Oceanside um, as we go along. Amazing quote by Henry Kissinger, um, and it's, it's incredible, very sobering. I think it's in their book. But he says this, the task of the leader is to get people, his people from where they are to where they have not been. That's always the issue. I don't see it. I don't understand it. And you actually just want to gently say, well, that's because you're not leading. You're following. Pray for your leaders that they lead you into that bigger space. And to, from where they are to where they have not been. The people do not fully understand the world in which they are going. How many of you know that? Leaders must invoke an alchemy of great vision. And this is the scary part. Those leaders who do not are ultimately judged failures. Even though they may be popular at the moment. You see, we often 
forfeit vision for popularity because many people just like it as they are, where they are. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be um, taken to somewhere else. They love it where they are. And so we all want to be dreamers. I want you guys to dream big. And I want to tell you that honestly, before God, if your dream can be done in your own strength, then you don't need God. I don't know how many people told us not to come and plant this church, in the church. How many people? In good faith and worried about us and worried about our kids. And when all hell broke loose here, we had people wanting to pay for us to go back home and give us tickets and all of this because the markets wouldn't come to our church, and the Van Rensburgs wouldn't, and the Stefanis all were looking over the fence for years. <laughs> but you know, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Eh? Exactly. And so we're very happy to have them here. But, uh, so what is the vision of Oceanside? And we're going to, I'm going to read this through to you, and it's, I think it's in that book. It says, we have a dream to establish. This is what we want to be, a multicultural community of friends. Remember, I can send you this. A multicultural community of friends. We want this church to, to represent the nations. The nations represented in the city. All colors and creeds and languages and tribes and tongues. Why do we want that? Because if we can equip them and send them to where they come from. What an amazing benefit that is. And I look at this university, and I pray, God, one day, that we have a group of people that really catch a vision for that, because we are talking first-generation heathens from heathen nations. We don't even have to get on a plane. We can catch a bus there, and if you want a bus pass, we'll give you one. And we can reach the nations of the world. They are coming to us. And they're right in our midst. And it's wonderful to go to India and Nepal and Congo and Australia. And I love that. But God has put us here, time and space. Uh, and we, read, we, we, we quote that, but we never really read it. But it's an amazing scripture in Acts. I think it's Acts 17, if I can find it here. Um, Acts 17. And it says there, 23, um, God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men breath and life and everything else. So, number one, God doesn't need us, but we need him. And we need to remember that. That in this partnership, he brings 100%. And we'll speak a little bit about that. Uh, obedience uh, soon. But he says this here, from one man he made every nation of men, we know that's Adam, that they should inhabit the whole earth and, do, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places they should live. None of us, although we think we came on a whim or by an accident or a car ran out of gas and we stopped in Nanaimo, it was not an accident. You are here for a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. And this is the, this is the purpose. It says that God did this so that men would seek Him and perhaps reach out to Him or reach out for Him. How will they seek Him and reach out for Him? He put us here so that through us, through our lifestyle, through our love for them, for our laying down our lives for them, for us being there, when they're in jail and when they're thirsty and when they're hungry and when they need clothing, not to get healthy and well-clothed people to go to hell, but through that so they may reach out and find Him. Though He's not far from each of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. So it's important that we have uh, an impact not only out there but in the nations. And we, So the multicultural, but I really am dreaming uh, to to see more Asians, to see more um, 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 South Americans, to see more um, Europeans and Africans in the life of the church, so we can equip them and go and impact through them, impact their families. 
who are loved, forgiven, and accepted, a safe place where people can be restored, trained, and take what they have learned and spread it to their neighbors and their nations. So that is our full vision statement. And I remember when we planted this church, I had asked the people, what's the statement? They had to learn that. And nobody could remember it. Not even myself. We are going to be an intergalactic people of space colonization and all of this. And I remember Bill Hybel said something, and he said, if your vision can, cannot be explained on a T-shirt, it's too big, too long. And so that's how we got gathering, healing, training, and sending. And that is as big or as small as you want it to be. It's huge, gathering. It's the gathering the lost. How many lost people just in the city? About 97,000, they say, not going to church. And from Cassidy to Lawrenceville. How many people are no longer going to church that need to be gathered? How many people need emotional, physical, spiritual healing that the psych wards are full. Everybody's on Prozac and, and our kids are on whatever that stuff is they're giving them now. Uh, and um, people need to be healed emotionally, spiritually, and physically. We want this to be a safe place where people can come and be themselves. Where We're not shocked when people one day dare to tell the truth. But they feel they can get rid of their baggage. And they won't be judged. But they will be loved, forgiven, and accepted as Christ does them. As we read about Paul, I was once a violent man. But I was shown mercy. And he said, it's because of that. And because of his grace, I am what I am. And God wants to bring the people from the highways and the byways. God wants to bring them in in their droves. And I feel and I believe we will be shocked at what the church looks like if we really allow God to have his way. And we're going to talk about traditions a bit later on. And then what we want to do is take what we have learned and not just explode with all this knowledge, but give it away. And starting with our, na na uh, our neighbors and ending in the nations. A gathering, healing, equipping, and sending church. And thereby fulfilling the great suggestion, I mean the great commission. <laughs> this is a commission by God for the church. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go in my authority and make disciples of all nations. Starting here in our little Jerusalem, in our Judea, B.C., in our Samaria, Canada, and it goes to the uttermost parts of the world. And it's not one or the other. It's all. And so majority of people in the church, as I've seen, although we, we focus on sending and sending, the majority of the people in the early church never left their city. Four would take teams, or four or five or six, but the rest stayed in their city and impacted that city with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my heart is and my vision is that when we, when we do stand before our, our, our Lord and Savior and give an account, as we will, the Word of God says, that we are at least given our, our best shot. And I tell you, it started with 12 guys. And 120, and it spread without internet, Twitter, tweet, or whatever, without anything. With a donkey and a camel and a few leather parchments, God turned the world upside down. How much more today if we in this room lead others into their freedom? So whether you lead, it's not about titles. Leadership is never meant to be a title. That's why I don't call myself Pastor Mike. I'm Mike, who is a pastor. 
or an elder. I don't call the bus driver Mark, bus driver Mark. I say, hey Mark, what do you do? I drive a bus. Because there's no titles. Jesus actually says, call no one rabbi except me. And it's amazing how we don't mind, you talk about traditions, how we don't mind calling Jesus by his first name, but we call everybody else by apostle, doctor, prophet, evangelist, Joe. It's crazy. We are all called, we're all equal, and we'll see that. And we're all called to fulfill the Great Commission. So uh, what I want to do, talking about vision, we share the vision of the church, pray into it, and like I say, it's as big as as small as you want it to be. And, um, but I, I want to speak on things. I was going to open a discussion at the end if we can. But I want to think, talk on things that kill vision that suck the oxygen and the life out of a church, that can really make it a drag being a Christian. And so I've got a few here, and I was thinking about which is one of the main things that will kill vision in a local church. And I want to say this is tradition. Tradition. You know, one of the things the enemy loves for leaders to be involved in more than anything else is fighting battles within the life of the church. It just sucks energy, it sucks life, and it does kill vision. You see, one of the barriers to vision is the notion that God would never cause us to change what we have always done, even if it does not work. And the church... Is really good. To, so we're talking about vision and things that kill the vision. And I just mentioned tradition as the first one here. The church is so good at doing the same thing over and over. And you go to some of the older traditional churches, and I tell you they're empty because they refuse to let go of some of their tradi traditions. And then what is the sign of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So therefore the church must be pretty insane. So a vision killing statement would sound like this. But we've never done it that way before. So? And then you have to go through the good, a true story in the city. I was here about four or five years ago, friendly with one of the pastors, no longer here. Amazing guy. A large church in the city. And um, I went to visit him one day, and I saw that they had gone from red carpets to blue carpets. They were the ugliest red carpets I've ever seen. So I said to him, hey, you got rid of the red carpets. He said, I nearly lost my job over it. He said, you won't believe it. You won't believe what a stir this has made in the life of the church. So I said, why didn't you get rid of the pews? He said, do you want me to be hung from the door here? <laughs> and it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how they can suck life and effort and vision out of it. But I want to say this about tradition. Traditions are not bad in themselves. We need to understand that. You see, if used correctly, they become a bridge between our past and our future. So instead of breaking down and starting again, we build on the foundations already laid. And I've seen that over and over. And even churches I go to in transition, you guy comes in, that's all gone. New again. And it breaks my heart because so much prayer, effort, and time has been taken to get the church. Maybe they've just got the foundation laid. But at least it's laid. Let's stop putting bricks on top of it. Let's not dig it up. And trying to be cool and trying to be new, we need to honor the, the things of the past, hear God, and build on them. Not confusing everybody and my heart and my dream for this church 
is that the next leader of this church will be raised up in and through this church and equipped by people like myself and Mark and other apostolic teams to lead this church in its future. I want a person that has a heart and a love for this church. I don't mind what they change, but I want them to build on top. And they will, and it will change, and it should change. But this notion that let's just chuck it all out, because I'm the dude, and so on. I'm telling you, I've, I've seen the devastation of good people that have so money and time and effort and life and been given no, no option of even having some kind of say in the transition. And so we must be careful because we are speaking about the bad sides of tra um, tradition too. You see, where tradition goes wrong is when it becomes a non-negotiable. Instead of a stepping stone. And therefore it becomes a stumbling block. And robs us and the future generations. And causes us to fight the wrong battles. It's a very powerful thing. People fight more for tradition sometimes than for the word of God or anything else. You touch that thing. And we've got to be careful in ourselves. God is moving. We want, to, we want the, the absolute for us, as Deborah said, is the inerrancy of the Word of God. There's a big attack on that. A huge attack. Some people that I love and respect I'm reading now, and I can't believe it. It actually depresses me. But it also puts a fear in me, because if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. And so I'm not sitting around proud of oh, us and them. I'm saying, God, help us fight the right battles. Amen? See, yeah, people often defend tradition more than the Word of God. You see, vision is always a reflection of the future and requires change. That's vision. It's ongoing revelation. It's unpacking that. And so take those four words, and it might look totally different to how that's walked out by future generations, but I pray that they build on that. I pray that they build on that. You see, tradition is a reflection often of the past and an aversion to change. And so we fight the wrong battles. It's all through church history. When, when uh, organs first came into the church years ago, it was of the devil. And it hasn't stopped since then. It's of the devil. And you see, we can be culturally relevant. And we need to be. I remember going to watch a concert downtown, you know, Golden Shadow were playing and some of the other guys. And I looked at the people jumping up, up and down and, and um, a marsh pit going and all of this. Deborah and I had earplugs in. First thing I did was walk in the door. Wesley gave me earplugs. So I knew we were in trouble. But I thought, God, how are we going to reach these people the way church is today? You see, we want them to come into our sterile environment. We think we're cool. We're not cool to those people. To the gods and those people, we don't, we don't even know what it means. Especially when you get to my age. But we want them to come into our sterile environment and behave like us. We don't want to change. But we want them to change everything as they walk in the door. And that is not going to reach these next generations. They want to know they loved and they belong before they'll ever think of behaving any other way, because they've never been loved before. They don't know what it's like. That community in there, they are tight. I tell you what, you watch it. They are tight, tight, tight. Whether it's for sex, drugs, and rock and roll, whatever, they are tight. And we want to get into their world. If we want them to come into our world, we better get into their world. And we better rescue them. You don't stay on the ship with your arms folded while somebody's drowning. Hopefully, you try and rescue them. And we are on a rescue mission. 
And I tell you, with the gifting and anointing and talent, I tell you what, I think someday people will leave this church in droves if God really does what He wants to do in reaching the next generations because that is my heart. I mean, I look at my grandchildren and I think, what kind of world are they going into without God? You see, what happens when we stop changing in the natural? What happens? We die. Every day we're changing. And in the supernatural, the same. So the question we need to ask then, between these two, is there a marriage between the two of these things? And the answer is yes. God can and does use tradition to build a church. But not simply because they are traditions, but because they serve His purpose. And when they no longer serve His purpose, they need to be discarded. He will use anything. He'll use a donkey. But when those traditions become idols and God moves on, that's when the trouble starts. You see, we need to let go. We need to understand that in how we do things. You see, the only unchanging absolute on which we build is on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the Word of God. That's our battle. That's the only battle that God has called us to fight. Jesus called the drunkard and a wine bibber. A drunkard and a wine bibber. It means he must have drunk wine. He made enough of it, his life. I bet you he never ever got drunk. Oh, and we know he never did, because he never sinned. But he identified, he went into their holes, and he rescued them. And that's what God wants the church to be. So yes, God does use our traditions. But that is only if we allow him to, and if we are humble, flexible, and teachable, and willing to let go. And if we become inflexible and unteachable, and teachable, the very thing that got us to where we are becomes the thing that stops us from moving on. And that's church history in a nutshell. Another vision killer is fear. Fear of failure. Fear of the future. Fear of making mistakes. Dudley, I read his book, and some of you saw him on the screen. He would tell us, sitting in this as young people, if you're going to make a mistake, make a big one. Don't make a small mistake. What's the point? That's how he speak to us. So we've made lots of big mistakes. You see, vision requires change, and change means breaking out of our comfort zones and doing new things in which we have absolutely no self-confidence outside of God. That's who I am. That's what I am. That's our work. Our salvation doesn't change, but we actually become irrelevant. And the churches are becoming irrelevant to the future generations. And the ones that are trying to be relevant are chucking out the very thing that they should keep, the Word of God. And so, change is scary and risky. And risk raises the possibility of failure. And none of us want to fail. And the fear of failure is a huge sampling block. Because we have failed before. And we tend to dwell on those past failures. And they limit our future. And this is the key. We only fail in God when we become afraid of making mistakes. And refuse to risk again. So any time we fail. When we become afraid of making mistakes and refuse to risk again, become timid, weak. Instead of those days where, man, we've got to change the world. And we, if we restrict, restrict ourselves to what you, that which is safe, 
we miss out on our God given potential. And I look at those two young guys right in there in Tofino. Don't stop risking. Don't stop being unafraid to make mistakes. God is with you and God is going to use you in a powerful way. And you guys are some of the new breed leaders that God is raising up in the nations. They're in this church all over the way. You guys. And don't ever stop dreaming, dreaming big. Don't start dreaming for a little canvas tent over there. Start dreaming for a hotel. <laughs> God will bless you. And this is what Roosevelt said. Uh, there's a Roosevelt quote in the front here too. It was amazing. Well, he says, it's hard to fail, but it's even worse never to have tried to succeed. It is hard to fail, but it's even worse never too afraid to have tried to succeed. That's not in there, but there's another one of his quotes in the front. So that's a big one. We also fear. What else do we fear? We fear mistakes, fear failure, but we fear that things might get out of control. What happens if God really comes? It's amazing that Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, do not put out the Spirit's fire. That means we can. Do not quench the Spirit. So what we have, we have our little spiritual water buckets. And as soon as those flames get a little bit big, we go, we put them out. And sometimes we should just allow wild growth instead of trying to make the church a bonsai tree that looks good, that bears no fruit, and is useless. Pruning is good. Hey, Katie. We learned that from Katie. You see, we fear releasing the reins of our lives to God. We want to hold on to them. So we li limit what God can do through us because we want to do it in our own strength. So we limit God. We limit God. You see, fear of being in control is simply this. A lack of faith in God's ability to work through us for His purposes. It's a lack of faith in God's ability to work through us for His purposes. But when we let go, let go, this is what happened. Vision replaces fear, and with vision, hope comes. Hope for the future. Hope for this nation. Hope for our children. You see, God is never looking for people of great ability, but simply people who are available, humble, and obedient to Him and His Word. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world, to, the despised things and the things of that are not, to nullify the things that are. Why? Why did he do that? So that no man may boast before him. So that God will get the glory. If God could use those dudes on the backside of Nanaimo, in the school gymnasium, on Jingle Pot Road, he can use anybody. And that's the point. That God will get the glory. God will not share His glory with another. And you, we're going to see that. I think we're going to be shocked at the future leaders coming out of prisons, coming out of major addictions. God's going to set them free by the power of the Spirit. He's going to give them dreams and vision and revelation, and we're going to spend our lives trying to put them out if we're not careful. 
see a, another one and I'll, I'll not for a few more minutes. I'm worried Mark's going to charge through that door any minute. Just, I'm going to open the window and I'm going to. Complacency, a vision killer. Complacency. And this is the attitude of complacency in the church. It doesn't matter what we do. God doesn't really care how we do it. He'll bless our efforts anyway. Doesn't care. Well, whatever. We do a half job. And God has to deal with second best. You see, the the vision I wrote this, the vision statement of a complacent church would be we are half baked and half blessed. <laughs> and we're happy with that. And it's useless. Pruning is good, eh, Katie? We learned that from Katie. You see, we fear releasing the reins of our lives to God. We want to hold on to them. So we li limit what God can do through us because we want to do it in our own strength. So we limit God. We limit God. You see, fear of being in control is simply this. A lack of faith in God's ability to work through us for His purposes. It's a lack of faith in God's ability to work through us for His purposes. But when we let go and let go, this is what happened. Vision replaces fear, and with vision, hope comes. Hope for the future. Hope for this nation. Hope for our children. You see, God is never looking for people of great ability, but simply people who are available, humble, and obedient to Him and His Word. And Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 1, 26-29. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world, to, the despised things and things are, that are not, to nullify the things that are why. Why did he do that? So that no man may boast before him. So that God will get the glory. If God could use those dudes on the backside of Nanaimo, in the school gymnasium, on Jingle Pot Road, he can use anybody. And that's the point. That God will get the glory. God will not share his glory with another. And you, we're going to see that. I think we're going to be shocked at the future leaders coming out of prisons, coming out of major addictions. God's going to set them free by the power of the Spirit. He's going to give them dreams and vision and revelation, and we're going to spend our lives trying to put them out if we're not careful. See uh, another one. I might have got a few more minutes. I'm worried Mark's going to charge through that door any minute. Just, I'm going to open the window and I'm going to. Complacency. A vision killer. Complacency. And this is the attitude of complacency in the church. It doesn't matter what we do. God doesn't really care how we do it. He'll bless our efforts anyway. Doesn't care. Well, whatever. We do a half job. And God has to deal with second best. You see, the, 
the vision who wrote this, the vision statement of a complacent church would be, we are half-baked and half-blessed. <laughs> <laughs> and we're happy with that. You see, God doesn't only care about what we do, He cares how we do it. How we represent Him. If you get that, whatever you do in word and deed, you do it as unto the Lord. When you're putting chairs out, you're praying over them. God, fill this chair. When you're putting the cups out, God, bring in the thirsty, bring in the lost. When you're standing at that door, Lord, may I be um, a light to people that are coming in here broken. Lord, give me, while I'm sitting in my pew, Lord, give me a word. Like, we don't even have to go to Costco. Let's start at Oceanside of encouragement for somebody in this place. God, I'm here to serve you. And I want to give my best. Not second best or second last. Remember the whole story of fortune is not like that. The pastor's kids always had the clothes with holes in them. And Dudley would say, you know why my kids are so naughty? It's because they hang out with your kids. <laughs> You see, if God gets irritated, and I believe uh, if God gets irritated, I believe it's over a half-baked, lukewarm church. And I'm going to read this from Revelation, the last church that Jesus had a word for. Revelation 3, 15 to 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. If you're going to be a sinner, do it well. Go for it. But if you're going to serve me, do it with all your heart. With all your heart. He says, because you're lukewarm, I'm about, and the original manuscripts say, vomit you out of my mouth. We like to say spit. It's a little bit. From place in church, and we say, God, use us. For your glory. You see, God's passion for mankind, God's a passionate God. He's a passionate God. He wants us to be passionate about what we do. Simply revealed in giving His Son Jesus for us. It wasn't a rational decision, it was a passionate, emotional decision, I believe, out of love for us and complacently kills vision and results and it kills passion and results us doing a form of godliness which is religion where we just go through the motions then that's what we got to do because we don't dig up seed every six weeks to see if it's growing And we don't know what God is doing. And God has a long-term view. And we will see that in this. You see, God's vision for ministry is long-term. God is a timeless God. God is a patient God. And when the disciples said Jesus was coming back soon, in the context of eternity, 2,000 years is one blink. So we don't know. But if we always changing and reacting, well, they're doing that and we're losing people or, or we've got to become more relevant. We've got to tone down our message. We've got to do this. Hey, we've got to do what God says. And we might go smaller to go bigger or whatever. It, it happens. As long as we are not creating the issues and we trust in God. You see... God's ministry is long-term, and His vision should outlive the visionary, the person who God gave the vision to. It should outlive Him. We spoke about that in dreams. His goals are eternal, eternal goals and not temporal. 
and his knowledge and resources, if we tap into him and trust him and are good stewards of what he gives us, are unlimited. I heard a preacher say once, and it convicted me, God is looking for people he can trust with his resources. Because he doesn't want those resources to kill them. How many times have people come saying, I need a better job, I need this, I need that. Then all of a sudden, they've got a new boat and a new this and a new cottage. And they're not at church. Then they lose it all and they're back in the church. So what do you pray for that person? I won't answer it. His resources are unlimited. And his timing is different from ours. The time to sow, there's a time to reap. There are seasons in God. And we don't know fully when they're going to end and when they're going to start. But there are seasons. And we've got to discern the season. And we can't make that season into a tra tradition. But he's eternal. And our little blink on this earth. If we want it and now, Jenner, a microwave popcorn church. We want it now. We don't want to pay any price. We don't want to do anything. We want to be complacent. Now, I'm speaking to leaders. I hope you come back next week. But we want all of the stuff. And God says, man, do I want to give it to you? Ezra, do I want to give you everything? I'm his grandfather. I love him. I love my children. But he's not looking after what he's got. I need to teach him that. I need to teach him that. I'm not really good at it because I'm a grandparent. Michelle and then take them away. But it's like us. What has God placed in our hands? What are we at Oceanside? Well, if we have this, we have that. If I have this and I have that. Yeah, don't worry. God says, seek me first in my kingdom. And I'll give you all the stuff you need. My translation is, you look after my stuff, says God, and I will look after yours. It's a season and it's time. And I started, we started this by speaking of dreaming big. And my timing is perfect. Rather than seek quick results and short-term benefits, let us dream the big dreams of God. To be a part of the transformation of lives, cities, and cultures. And the only person who can limit your ability to dream big is yourself. No matter what people say, no matter what happens to you, you are the master of your own destiny. Because you take it to God. And God said, I forgave much. You forgive little. And if we do this, if we walk in this church, I'd love to preach this uh, on, on a Sunday, but they won't give me an hour and a half. But if we could do this, imagine. Imagine. When we open our hands and we say, fill it, Lord, instead of holding on to our traditions, holding on to our, our issues, holding on to all of this stuff, holding on, how can God fill a clenched fist? But we say, God, I want to lay those things down before you. I want to count for you. I don't care how many mistakes I make. I don't care what a fool I look for you, Lord God. But I'm going to go for it, and I'm going to go big. And I want to read this in, in the front of this little book. If you want to turn to it, and then I want to pray for you. This I've got in my office. And putting this book together, I put it in the cover there for a purpose. It says, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood. Who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, 
knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself uh, on a worthy cause. At best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. Who at worst if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither knew victory nor defeat. Let us be like that. Can we pray? Father, I thank you for this amazing group of people that would take time out of their schedules, Lord God, to, to allow us to minister to them, Lord. And Lord, these are sobering times, Lord. But I do know that you are coming back for a victorious church. You're waiting for a people to arise, even as Russ spoke out of Isaiah 6. And Isaiah's response was, without knowing the consequence of what would happen to him, here I am, Lord, send me. And Lord, we open our hands, we open our hearts, Lord. And I pray for a refreshing upon us, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you fill us with humility, with courage and strength, Lord God, to stand and having all done all us simply to stand. And I pray for your anointing upon us, Lord God. Lord, that we will dream big in you, Lord God. Not in arrogance, but in you and in humility, knowing that unless you come through, we're not going to make it. Lord, create that first love, passion and fire afresh in us, Lord. We want to see your kingdom come. Lord, this is our vineyard that you've given us to tend well with the many vineyards you have in the city, but this is the one you've given us, and you said it needs to bear fruit, fruit that lasts. So, Lord, I pray you bless these wonderful people, Lord. I pray that even tonight that will, they will begin to dream again. Lord, I pray where they need to, Lord God, they'll simply repent and turn around and do the things they did at first. You are always waiting with open arms. You are never angry with us, Lord. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for your spirit upon us and your anointing upon us. I thank you for Andy and Sarah, Lord. Bless them, anoint them, Lord. May they even dream bigger than they are, Lord. And may, Lord, you put people that will blow wind in their sails and not quench what you want to do with them. And I pray that for every young person in this church, Lord. We as the older ones, Lord, in the years that we have ahead, Lord, we will blow wind in their sails, Lord. We will... We, we will make space for there to be mistakes. Make space for there to be mess, Lord God. Because we want to see your kingdom come. And your will be done right here in this vineyard as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.